Uh, let's all prepare ourselves as we listen to the message this morning, the third installment from the series, Fear Not. And the title of the message this morning is The Savior's Grace. And I'll give you Pastor Noel Espinosa. So we are back now to Grace, uh, <laughs> Grace, General Community Quarantine, uh, which is a relatively relaxed quarantine, but for how long? The schedule is until August 31, and then a new assessment is going to be done again. And perhaps uh, it will continue. Perhaps another uh, form of quarantine is going to be put in place. Uh, there is so much uncertainty and fluctuation, and that is characteristic of our fearful times. We already have many fears as we grapple with our day-to-day -day, uh, struggles. The pandemic has raised our fears to the maximum. And whatever one claims as being fearless, it is either he is delusional or just whistling in the dark. Fear affects all personalities, as I've always said. It affects all races, all sectors of humanity, whatever level of education you have. It affects even both believers and unbelievers alike. The fearless person exists only in fiction, in superhero stories. But among real people like you and me, it is a day-to-day -day struggle. And that is why this month we began a series of messages called from different passages, but what tied them together are the words, fear not. The passages are drawn from different contexts, reminding us that fear has many faces just as there are many godly answers to fear. We began the first message with Jesus sending his disciples and their being sent will prompt the fear that Jesus made them anticipate that there will be an unwelcome reception to their message and that would create a, uh, an, a response of persecution and some of them in fact will be martyred. And Jesus' words to them are, Fear not, therefore you are of more value than many sparrows. And as I've shown, this does not refer to human value. It is referring to the sovereignty of God that extends to the tiniest matter and the most routine of events in life. We learn there that the Father's care for his children is moved by his sovereign will. Uh, and when you combine sovereignty and care, that is a powerful combination indeed. Last week in our second message, we see Jesus in Luke going to Jerusalem. And the fear that that can instill in the disciple pertains to the fear of material want, material provision. And Jesus' challenge to them are in the words, fear not, little flock. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And there we learn that commitment to the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ overcomes fear of material want. We will come to a third text in which there is those same words, fear not, related to Jesus. And I would invite you to turn to John chapter 12. Our text is verse 15, but again, to get the context, we will read from verse 9 to verse 16. John chapter 12, verses 9 to 16. And I read, When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came, not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not! daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. 
His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. Now, this event that is narrated here is known as Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It is one of those events that you have, uh, you have in all the four evangelists, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it is a time that a large crowd of Jews gathered in Jerusalem because of a feast. And the feast that is referred to here is the feast of the Passover, the most important feast for the Jews. It commemorates the time when the Jews were redeemed from their bondage to Egypt and there was the shedding of the blood of the lamb that was on the doorposts of the Israelite households and the angel of death that had smitten the firstborn of Egypt passed over the households of the Israelites because as Yahweh said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And it was made a law in Israel that annually there would be that feast of the Passover. So this is the context. And in common with the Synoptic Gospels, we are told that there was a large crowd that welcomed Jesus as he entered Jerusalem. And they were crying out in welcome to him. Now in this one event, there are several Old Testament passages that intertwine, and we will see this in the very words that the crowd used to welcome Jesus. They said, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Now that is taken from Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26. There you have the word in Hebrew, Hosanna, save us, O Lord, is what it means. So they were calling for Jesus to save them. But what salvation were they expecting? By this time, that salvation is couched in the expectation of military and political rescue from Rome. Para sa kanila, ang kaligtasan ay maligtas sa kanilang pagkakaalipin sa imperyo ng Roma. So that is how they expected the Savior to come. In fact, it was a Jewish tradition that the Messiah would come on the night of the Passover. That is why pious Jews did not want to miss the Passover. It might just not be the Messiah comes on that particular Passover. And so when Jesus was entering into Jerusalem, he might just be the Messiah and they cried out, that they be saved, but their salvation expectation is rescue from the Roman bondage. So they were expecting someone to lead an army to gain victory in war over Israel's enemies. But what is this? The supposed warrior king is not even riding a war horse, but a lowly donkey. And this becomes the basis of John's quotation from Zechariah 9, 9 and 10. But there is an interesting twist that John makes. In the original Zechariah 9 and verse 9, the word is rejoice, daughters of Jerusalem. Here, John translates it or replaces it with the words fear not. And that means that in the word rejoice, which means glad tidings, or in short, the gospel, John is seeing really an exhortation through the act of Jesus entering into Jerusalem, not on a war horse, but on a lowly donkey. He is seeing the gospel. And the gospel has the effects of telling his disciples Fear not. I draw the message from this in this way. The gospel answer to fear is the kingly rule of Christ in the realm of salvation by grace. Ang sagot ng Ibanghelyo sa takot ay ang makaharing pamamahala ni Kristo 
sa larangan ng kaligtasan sa biyaya. The gospel answer to fear is the kingly rule of Christ in the realm of salvation by grace. Again, the feast of the Passover that surrounds this event is defining of that saving mission of Christ. The Passover is redemption of the Old Testament. The Passover had the shedding of blood so that judgment may pass over the Israelite households. And now John is consciously transferring to Jesus what the Passover was to the Israelites, except that it is no longer bondage to Rome. It was not Rome that was replacing Egypt. It is not by way of war, by smiting the enemies. Rather, Jesus came to exercise his rule by saving sinners. In other words, we have here salvation by grace. And that message of the gospel as salvation by grace, according to John, has the effect of saying, fear not. And we ask, how so? How does salvation by grace as a message become an answer to fear? Let me suggest two ways. First, salvation by grace overcomes the strictness of the law. Ang kaligtasan sa biyaya ay nananaig sa kahigpitan ng kautusan. Salvation by grace overcomes the strictness of the law. And secondly, salvation by grace produces true submission to the Lord. Ang kaligtasan sa biyaya ay namumunga ng tunay na pagpapasakop sa Panginoon. Salvation by grace produces true submission to the Lord. And as I shall show, both are effective answers to fear. First, salvation by grace overcomes the strictness of the law. We must not miss here one of the leading actors or some of the leading actors in the drama, and that is the chief priests. We are told that the chief priests planned to kill Lazarus. What was the role of Lazarus? Remember, John was written with the conscious design by the author John to collect the seven signs that will prove Jesus to be the Christ, the Son of the living God, so that readers may believe in Him for eternal life. And the culminating sign, as we saw in a recent series, was the raising of Lazarus from the dead, which is narrated in John chapter 11. Now, this became a widespread news to the Jews. And many of them came to Jerusalem among other things, with that curiosity of looking at Lazarus and the chief priests representing the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, the law, in other words, were very much aware of this and they planned to kill Lazarus. Now let me just say, this is not for sheer murderous intent. These are religious people. But they see in Jesus a threat to the paramount place of the law. And Lazarus has become instrumental to that by drawing crowds to believe in Jesus. And now they are entering, Jesus is entering Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the most sacred place on earth in keeping the law prominent. And by keeping the law prominent, that keeps the priests in power. Jesus is now entering it, and by entering it, he is challenging the prominence, the strictness of the law. What has does this got to do with answering fear? Well, simply this, religion that is based on legal strictness is moved by fear. Ano mang relihiyon na nakabatay sa kahigpitan ng batas ng kautusan, ay kinikilos ng takot. It may be fear of punishment, fear of judgment. And by being moved by fear, 
One is pressed to obey whatever ritual they say is necessary in order to remove sin. And this is why they intended to make Lazarus an example of what happens when one is in opposition to the prominence of the law. They were going to kill him. They will meet out death on him because that was the punishment. And that only is a picture of human religion. You know, human religion or human approach to God that is not based on what God has revealed in scriptures will stand on two false platforms. One platform is to invoke the love of God without any concern for sin. That is the chosen option of many today. Now that kind of thinking of God that he is all love, no punishment, no judgment, no law, will have no fear of God, but only because of self-deception. But for the more religious, in the sense of taking seriously the righteousness of God, their option is the law. Their platform is self-achievement by morality that is the Pharisaic model. They may have the rituals as represented by the chief priests. And many religions are following the Pharisaic model. To be accepted by a righteous God through my obedience, through my morality. If I'm speaking to any one of you there, and you are still standing on this platform of what you can do, what you can achieve by your good works, by your religion, by your church, by your morality. You are on sinking sand. And the chief ingredient for this kind of religion to thrive is fear. If you are not righteous, God will punish you. Now, let me first say that something is fundamentally correct in this thinking of the law. It is meant to convict of sin. Ang batas, ang kautusan, ibinubunyag niya ng ating pagkamakasalanan. Romans 3.20 tells us that by the law is the knowledge of sin so that every mouth in the world, Jew or Gentile, may be shut. It tells us you are a sinner. But in the eyes of the chief priests, it was the means of righteousness. And for anyone to challenge the law was a threat to what has sustained them in their power, in their priesthood. And for their thinking, there was nothing wrong to plot the murder of Lazarus and Jesus. They are means to their noble end of keeping the first place for the law so that it may continue to instill fear. And when you approach God on the platform of what you can do that he will find acceptable, you only have one ingredient for you, and that is fear. But here is Jesus. He did not come to simply apply the law to evoke fear. He represents himself as the new Passover, the one who will shed his blood so that when that blood is applied to a believer, judgment will pass over them. That's the judgment on Egypt. And the riding of the donkey was an acted parable. It was not the expected war horse. He came not to slay as did the judgment angel that came to Egypt that has smitten all the firstborn. That was not what Jesus came to do in Jerusalem. Now, it will do good to quote more fully the source of this citation in Zechariah 9, verses 9 and 10. It says, Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, 
the fall of a donkey. Listen, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem <laughs> and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. So he is entering Jerusalem not as a warrior champion in order to smite the enemies. He came not to make war. He came with shalom. The overall Hebrew word for how things should be. We often translate it as peace, but it means how things God designed them to be. And this is Jesus' response to the cry of Hosanna, save us, but not in the way of war victory. Yes, the king is claiming his rule, but it is not by war. It is salvation by grace that overcomes the law. You know, before the anesthetics were discovered, these are substances that are used for anesthesia. Surgery was a, a very fearful thing. Many, in fact, died from the pain of surgery more than from their disease. So the surgery, which was meant to heal because of its pain, killed until there was anesthetic. Well, that's what the law does. Without the anesthetic of the gospel, it will produce killing pain. It will kill, just as the chief priests wanted to do to Lazarus and to Jesus. So are you depending on the law? Are you depending on what you can do for God to be accepted? It is a quicksand. I challenge you to stand upon the Savior's grace on your dealing with God in order to transcend fear. Manindigan ka sa biyaya ng tagapagligtas sa bawat pakikitungo mo sa Diyos upang mangibabaw ka sa iyong takot. Here, the use of palm branches is significant. It was actually mandated not for the Passover but for another annual feast, the Feast of Tabernacles. And this was also done in the intertestamental period during the Maccabean revolt, when they managed to rebuild the temple, they used palm branches. Until now, Jews celebrate one of their most important holidays is the Hanukkah, celebrated in December. And this is celebrating the temple of the Maccabean revolt. And so when the crowd was using palm branches to welcome Jesus, there is here in an implicit recognition that Jesus is the new tabernacle, the new temple. What is the function of the tabernacle or the temple? It was there that God met with his people. It is as it were, heaven and earth met in that one piece of structure of the temple, but the temple was gone in the Old Testament. And even the temple, great as it was, that was built by Herod, which was the temple standing in Jesus' time, that too will be destroyed in 70 AD. So where would God meet with his people? Where would heaven and earth meet? And the answer is Jesus. You don't meet God on the, on the basis of your achievement and morality. You must meet God in Jesus, otherwise it is hopeless. You will be, as Ephesians 2 says in verse 12, you are without God and without hope in the world until you are in Jesus. That is what Jesus said in John 2, 19. Destroy this temple, this great Herod's temple, and in three days I will raise it up referring to his resurrection. So if you will insist on approaching God by your own righteousness through the law, you are looking for fearful judgment. This is the explanation for the unexplained and the unnamed 
fear that beset many religious people. They are still dealing with God on the basis of what they can do, what they can achieve. And this does not give assurance in the time of death. And this pandemic makes it all uncertain for any one of us to determine how close we are to death. The answer to that fear is the one who rides not on a war horse, but on a donkey. Not to make war, but to give shalom, to give grace. It is possible for a Christian, after initially accepting salvation by grace at conversion, to then proceed with the law. That's what happened to the Galatians. And so we must have the mental discipline by the grace of God. That our every dealing with God is on the basis of grace. We must still cry, Hosanna, Lord, save us, but mean it differently than the welcoming crowd. We mean salvation from sin by grace. Not only at the point of conversion, but in every dealing with God, when we pray, or as we are doing now, when we worship, it must be on the basis of the one who rode on a donkey rather than on a war horse, dispensing grace. Even in the way of obedience, we must do so because of the grace given to us. Walter Marshall was a Puritan, not as well known as the other Puritans. He was among those who chose to be ejected from the Church of England in 1662. He died in 1680, and his one book credited to him was published posthumously in 1692. But for that one book, I am grateful to God for discovering it. This is that book, Gospel Mystery of Sanctification. And one of the most helpful statements in this book is when he said, the comforts of the gospel must precede and move the duties of the law. Ang kaaliwa ng ebanghelyo ay dapat ma mauna at siyang magpakilos ng pagsunod natin sa mga tungkuli ng kautusan. That's grace. Jesus entering Jerusalem, challenging the chief priests whose minds were set on murder in the interest of the strictness of the law. The gospel answers that. But in the second place, Salvation by grace produces true submission to the Lord. Ang kaligtasan sa biyaya ay namumunga ng tunay na pagpapasakop sa Panginoon. Now I stopped short deliberately in my quotation of Zechariah 9. I'll complete it now because the last sentence of Zechariah 9 verse 10 says, His rule shall be from sea to sea from the river to the ends of the earth. That's the rule of the one who rode on a donkey, something that would be considered contemptible, not ready for war, but through it, through salvation by grace, Jesus is going to rule from sea to sea, even to the ends of the earth. Do you hear the echo here of the Great Commission? That beginning from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth, the gospel is going to be preached. This is Jesus' conquest. Not by war, not by weapons of the military, but by salvation, by grace. And that means those who are conquered, those who are subjugated, do so willingly by faith. In Christ, and when they do, they see in Him the one who rules. If you are thinking that the first point means that you are free from any subjection to authority, 
you are wrong. We say with the Apostle Paul in Romans 3.31, Do we then make void the law through faith? By no means, miginoito. On the contrary, he says, we establish the law. So we're not anti-law, but we are pro-Jesus. And being pro-Jesus means subjection to him. And now he gives the law with the anesthesia of the gospel. And it no longer kills. So recipients of gracious salvation are marked by humble obedience, which overcomes fear. Ang mga tumanggap ng biyaya ng kaligtasan ay may mababang loob na pagsunod na siyang nananaig sa takot. Why am I saying that? Because there is no fear like a guilty conscience. There is no fear like that produced by disobedience. Walang takot na katulad ng konsensyang mabigat sa kasalanan. Walang takot kagaya ng pagsuway. We are advancing the rule of Christ. As a church, we are advancing the rule of Christ and in the language of Zechariah, we are advancing advancing it from sea to sea to the ends of the earth we crossed the philippine sea and the gulf of thailand in order that we may reach myanmar through our missionary why do we do that because we believe christ rules but even in our setting we cross divides between people so sinners may hear the gospel That is what we are doing, friends. If you still are not a believer in the gospel, see what God has done in His inscrutable wisdom so that the gospel may become available to all and to such as you are. And if you keep spurning it, you are adding and accumulating the gravity of your offense for the judgment day. Come to Christ. Cast yourself upon Him in faith and repentance. Well, there is one thing that will effectively hinder that, and that is fear. And the fuel of fear is disobedience. It is a hindrance to the full confession of Christ. Later in the Gospel of John, he will make reference to those in chapter 12, verse 42, Many even of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. So there's what fear does. It makes you disobedient. And Christians may have their fear that hinder full obedience to the rule of Christ. They forget that he now rules. When Japan surrendered in the Second World War, Some of them did not hear the news. And they thought they were still serving the emperor without realizing that by then, Douglas MacArthur was now the administrator of Japan in order to, in order to rebuild it. They did not know a change of rulers. But we know. And my challenge to you in closing is be occupied with Christ's glorious rule. And that rule is now to overshadow your fear in obedience. There's this verse that concludes our passage in verse 16 of John 12. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, they then remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. So at that point, they did not understand. But when Christ was glorified, he now rules gloriously as a result of his resurrection and ascension. They now understand. And what happened to these disciples? At first, they were uh, hiding in fear. But when they realized their, their Jesus was risen, their Jesus was exalted, they became a courageous band of witnesses. It is what? the glorious reign of Christ does to believers, to the church. We are now on the side of that exaltation. We understand Jesus' resurrection means he now exercises kingly rule. 
And if our actions were more defined by that, we could address better our fears that hinder obedience. So I ask you, what is an issue of obedience that is now calling you to subject yourself to the rule of Christ? Are you afraid? See him once again, who rides on a donkey of peace, of grace, rather than a strict law to smite. Come to him and live by his rule, and that will make us obedient. C.S. Lewis, in his most famous book, Mere Christianity, Describe this world as enemy occupied. But then in Jesus, the rightful king has landed. And we are now, his followers are on a mission of quote unquote sabotage. We are sabotaging the work of the devil by advancing the rule of Christ, but it takes obedient people. People who are not fearless, but people who are able to transcend their fear because they deal with God on the basis of grace and on the basis of grace, they obey. Self-righteousness and self-rule define the fear of the world. But for the Christian who is saved by grace, he hear again the words of our text, Fear not, Christ now rules.